Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. Stefan, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thank you very much. For people that are unfamiliar, I mean, we actually got our first introduction through Shan Rafael, who, uh, like I was just saying, he uh, we put his episode out today. Incredible individual and really, really privileged um, to be able to get this connection. So for people that are unfamiliar, I'm going to bore you with your own um, qualifications for a second, and I'm sure I'll get a million of them wrong anyway. But um, so you hold a master's uh, with, a dissertation, uh, with a dissertation in solving tactical problems using control engineering. Uh, systems identification and modeling and you then went on to become a doctor in philosophy at the department for fire safety science at lund university majoring in the area of command and control of firefighting operations with your minor being firefighting procedures that is a hell of a mouthful and i'm sure that only a very small um aspect of uh <laughs> of the, the adventures that you've taken i thought i sort of actually wanted to start in a random place which is like how, how do you know shan how did you guys sort of uh meet each other oh that is uh that is a actually a funny story in a sense because i was uh in in 2007 i was for some reason i don't really understand yet but i'm i'm still very grateful for it i was invited to uh, to uh, by the new, new zealand fire service okay to come over for, for a couple of weeks uh, and and to travel around and, and see uh, their countryside and how they do the operations and uh, that was a conference where I did some presentations and I went to do some presentation at uh, at least one, a couple of fire stations as well. A uh, lot of fun. And just a, just a couple of days before uh, coming coming down to New Zealand, uh, and, and this is actually amazing because the the the, sh- the shortest way to New Zealand from from Sweden is actually literally straight down. So. Okay. <laughs> You ha- you have these two countries on actually on opposite sides of the globe. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress. And we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. And and one night I was was standing in in a fire station and I was just about to to start my presentation. It's a volunteer fire station. Okay. So I was just about to start my presentation, just talking about the Swedish fire service a little bit. And they had this call and it was like 10 seconds and the room was empty. Really? And I was standing there. It's like, what, what, what happened? <laughs> and 20 minutes later, they came back. It was it a false alarm. And, and I did my presentation. And afterwards, we, we just had, had a couple of beers. And we talked about stuff. And I, I realized at that point that it's, um, you, you have these countries as far apart as you can come it's on the other side of the globe from my point of view yeah but we we do the same stuff we have similar equipment we have the same thoughts we we, we have the same jokes <clears throat> at the fire stations <laughs> uh, different brands of beer but that's another, another story and i mean it's and and i've been traveling uh, ever since uh, in, in a few places as well and I, and I realized that we wherever you are uh, internationally we, we have this common thing about putting fires out and, and saving people and car accidents and whatever mm. and it's at, at that point at that fire station I, I realized it was like a I don't know it was a moment <laughs> Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Just, just amazing to realize that we we have this international fire service community uh, doing stuff differently, but at the same time in a very, very similar way. 
Mm. That's same something jokes, that really fascinates me. The more, thoughts. yeah, yeah. The more I've done the podcast, the more it opens my eyes. Because initially, when I started doing this, like I had uh, certainly thought about the aspect of it being a niche, and you know, how many people in the Western world would I be able to speak to? I mean, there's a tremendous list, and I'll probably never get through that list. But then, as I even started to pan out even more and look at the global fire and rescue service, that's almost been the most fascinating thing to me because. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say we had somebody on from South Africa the other day and very similar problems everywhere, but there's something around the social biases, their upbringing, perhaps their economy, perhaps just the, the, the way that problem solving happens in those countries that they have come up to different solutions or different aspects of how to solve these ever present issues that we seem to have everywhere. I always we've got the whole animal factory. I feel like I should let my dog in. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a cat coming up behind me and I have a dog next to me in my cat on my couch here. So sorry. Well, coming back to Chan Rafael and just a couple of days before coming, coming down to New Zealand, I, uh, they told me that there's another, this other guy who's going to join us for a couple of days in the car when we was driving around. I met this guy in the car. He's like, oh, hello, good morning. And whatever. We, we started to travel and like five minutes into the trip, he started to ask me questions. Hmm. And I, I sort of realized that he, he knew more about my work than I did myself. So I have to dig in my, my, my bag and find my computer and put it up and figure Oh, and he had had these questions. I had to figure out the answers and everything. I had to look into my, my literature and everything. It's like, and that was Shan Rafael. And that was also one of those moments where I realized that when I, and I hadn't realized that before actually, uh, that when when I write stuff, I have people all over the world reading that stuff, and probably knows more of, of what I have written than I do myself because I just write read it. I write the stuff. I don't mm. read it. <laughs> Other people read it. I just write it. So. I found that when so, I've had conversations with people, we have people emailing and writing about the podcast about certain guests. And I'm like, damn, I was part of that conversation. And it seems to have evaporated out of my mind, um, yeah, which is, but yeah. I suppose it's the context again, isn't yeah. it? And and when you, when you say like those people know more about it than you do, perhaps they've simply had different experiences. Like, because you, you, you've got a very unique lens. I think that we, that you look through things. Not only have you gone down the academic route, but you also work, you know, as part of the fire and rescue service as well. But I wanted to cast our mind back a little bit because you actually started back in 86, didn't you? But how did your whole journey in the emergency services begin? Well, I we have this uh, mandatory uh, military service uh, a year. And I was, uh, I did that as as a firefighter in, in the Air Force uh, for a year. Uh, how old are you when you have to do that? Sorry, what, how old um, is mandatory service? 19. 18, do they still 19. do that now? We had this uh, a few years where, where we didn't have that mandatory military service, okay. but now we're sort of getting back on track again. Uh, I think it's really valuable to do things like that. And I yes. really wish we had it in the Western world because like, yeah. you pick up so many great character traits. I mean, yes. what do you think that does for, for people's development and building that character, having that time in service? Uh, well, just just sort of being sort of forced to to live with other people and work with other people and be res respectful to other people it's it's valuable mm. to anyone it's, it's yeah. a great it also acts like a great calibrator doesn't it the impact yes. that you have on those around you when you're sheltered in your own home with your own family you can be very unaware of the impact that you're having on other people and how to operate in normal society and then almost when you do enter a real profession perhaps in your 20s or your 30s some people are hit with an overwhelming surprise because of why they don't seem to be able to integrate or cooperate very well or even just like adhere to certain systems or rules maybe especially in the, in, in the military service because you have people from all over places and mm. from from all kinds of trades and some some of these guys uh, didn't go to school or not for like very long at least, and some of us were, were aiming at going on to university and some didn't. So it was a sort of a mixture of, of different people with different mindsets and mm. different thoughts. So that was kind of a very good a very good way to learn how other people uh, think and work and how they their view on, on things in the world. Mm. It's almost like a forced interaction, isn't it? Because you can't yes. just 
avoid it like you would in normal life you actually have to no. live around it and and also to work out how to work as a team in those environments with people that yeah. perhaps don't share similar views to you which is society in general yeah yeah no, so, so that you was, did that, that was, first year sorry yeah and that, then... was, that was a great year and then i went to university uh, had my my uh, bachelor degree in in the fire safety engineering and i went to this uh, we have this uh I think it's known as a two entry level system in the fire service. So you can you can start as a fireman and work your way up through the ranks. Yes. But you can also do uh, you can have this bachelor degree in, in fire safety engineering, and you do one year um, what 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 we call a senior officers course. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we have that now. It's effectively called direct entry. We're bringing it back in. So if you have a degree in anything really it hasn't necessarily got okay. to be in, in in something in the fire profession it just i think a degree demonstrates that you can assimilate a certain amount of information in a given period of time so you are yeah. perhaps of a you have the neurological capacity to yeah. uh yeah to lead it a certain or, or you know plan and organize at a certain level yeah so that that system was introduced in in 19 what 89 pretty much uh, i went to the second uh, course that uh, in, in that system and we still have it uh, and mm -hmm. i'm uh, these days i'm very much involved in the training of these senior fire officers young people wow. uh, i had an all year all day today uh, we did a class on uh, uh, well actually firefighting putting fires out but in, in model scale do you think they need to know things down at that level let's just wander off in this area for a second because when i speak to people in the uk and they go I'm very worried about people coming in from outside of the sector and not knowing anything about firefighting. But if you position them correctly, so in a lot of the UK, people will come in at an area manager, which is a different terminology across the UK. But some places they come in as a station officer or a station commander, which I think is a little bit close to the action. And what I mean by that is you have the ability at that level to potentially give a direct instruction to somebody that could cause them harm if you don't have a fuller understanding of the dynamics and, and ever-changing complexity of an incident. So that concerns me a little bit. What's your thoughts there? I think that, well, these these young people I have in my classes these days, um, they after this year, they have the, the, the formal rank of a fire chief. And I... but. It's it's not a, it may sound weird to someone, but I think it's a well actually to answer your question, I think it's very important for a any high ranked officer, including a, a commissioner or a fire chief, mm. to have this knowledge about what do you call that in English? And so, a, well, different a levels basic, of different ranks, a basic well, understanding. Let's say a, a first level firefighter. Fundamentals. Yeah, exactly. They need yeah. to know what the work is about uh, how they need do to know it. what it's about but do they need to be like and this is the argument i keep going through in my head with other people is do they need to be acutely aware of all of the potential hazards and stuff like that because ultimately most often they're not going to be right there on the incident ground and equally no. it's a little bit like saying if i was at a certain level in the fire service and i was in charge of it fire safety accounting whatever i don't need to know everything about that area i have a subject matter expert there so there's there's two sides to the coin isn't there they are still responsible true so if they uh, in order to to be responsible and to take that seriously they need to know how each individual fire well not only on an individual level but they need to know what the work as mm. a fireman is what it's about, the the risk they're taking, how they actually work on the fire scene, and how they assess the situation and all that stuff. And I think that is a, a very important basis for any high-ranked officer. Otherwise, they, I mean, even if you work with the budgets, if you don't understand what the the numbers in right. the Excel sheet is about... Mm -hmm. It's open to abuse, isn't it? It's open to you having the wall pulled over your eyes if you don't yeah. at least have a yeah. fundamental yeah. understanding of it. Yeah. Do you yeah. ever have a problem with respect from individuals at the grassroots level, at the firefighter no. level? Do they have? No. Do they not have any pushback against people coming in? It because this is where, like I say, we're starting to bring it back in, and some people are starting to voice those concerns of, you know, I'm not going to listen to so and so. What do they know about firefighting? Which well, is immature and frustrating at times. We used to have a discussion like that, but that is like 35 years ago. 
Okay. I mean, if you have if you have these young people, they they go through university, three and a half years. We give them a senior officers course one year, uh, and then they start to work in in the fire service. They have no experience, not really, but give them a few years. Then you have this very interesting and actually great mixture of a um, an academic background. Yeah, and then they have this experience. It works very well. You've got a dangerous hybrid there. I say dangerous yeah. in a in a complementary yeah. sense. You've got yeah. someone with a real, yeah. because ultimately, I I I think on the opposite side of the coin, there's actually something very dangerous about having a knuckle dragging firefighter like me if I've not had the correct academic development to have me in charge of a fire and rescue service at this point in my career, if I had accelerated through the ranks and people in the UK fire and rescue service are accelerating through the ranks at the minute, because we're going through so much retirement, there is a danger of having people in positions that actually you're effectively running a multi-million pound organization then, and you don't really have an understanding of what that involves. I had the commissioner in Stockholm in my, uh, as a student 20 years ago, he's doing great. Makes you sort of proud a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> very much actually but. what are the just for people that are and i'll put myself in this group people that aren't tremendously familiar with the setup of fire and rescue services over there what's the average sort of size and uh, what what's what, what does it look like over there sweden is is a, it's a very long country okay it's like uh, i think it's like 100 and 1800 kilometers something and we, we we tend to especially i live in the very south and we tend to sort of think that well stockholm is like in the middle mm-hmm. it's it's like a less than a third of the of the country so the northern parts of sweden is uh, it's it's not very populated there are people living there of course a lot of lots of people mm-hmm. but it's it's a very large part of the country which means that you have some very interesting issues in the fire service to to have to, to find people to work in the fire station. Yeah, but recruitment is challenging there. Yes, and it's it's a very long distance between uh, the cities and the fire stations. Down here in the south where I live, to in 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 any in any situation, any call we would get down here, I can have any resources as much as I like and more within 20 25 30 minutes okay and i'm really talking <clears throat> any any resources hmm. when i up in the northern parts of sweden you can have a, a fire stations in in a smaller city uh, with a crew of five or six or so maybe seven the next crew is like 45 minutes away an wow. hour an hour and a half away yeah so I mean, it's 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 a it creates some very special problems up in the mm. northern parts of Sweden. I uh, I had that when I first joined. I worked in a rural um, fire station, and again, we would be the furthest from any other station in the service that I worked for at the time. And uh, it really does present a different set of dynamics for like the structure and planning or strategic thought behind an incident commander's decision-making process and what they will have and when in terms of the initial actions when they get to an incident, which um, which I suppose kind of leads me into, because the work you've been doing predominantly for the last 15 years, I mean, we spoke about the instructing aspect there, but this part of your work in experimental and theoretical investigations of firefighting tactics, including methods, I found that, and I thank you for sending over the document. I'm actually going to um, attempt to to take a little passage of it here and just catapult us into a little bit of a discussion in around so the the documentation and we'll try and make it of it is it able to be available to people are you happy to have it shared if not that's absolutely fine yeah sure no yeah problem. okay so and, if anybody uh, wants some it, of uh, some of the literature in in that list is uh, should be available at least somewhere beautiful we'll we'll put a link to in the in the podcast so yeah, the sure. publication itself is around emergency response management in today's complex society which i think is a lovely little introduction because the complexity of the type of incidents that we're attending does require some fundamental changes around um tactics and so when it comes to tactics it says uh, the term tactic is often used in connection with sports 
and sporting events, which commonly uh, in connection with group activities. We also talk about tactics in connection with, for example, chess, which I think is a beautiful analogy, where the various pieces of a chess board can only be moved according to certain rules, i.e. certain set patterns and a situation must be handled according to these rules. Now, the pieces have different tasks in the game and the players have to use these pieces in the best possible way by making optimal use of their different qualities. These qualities must be applied effectively, partly in use of each piece and partly in terms of the pieces as a unit. This is a beautiful analogy in comparison to the situations that we face um, in incidents in the emergency services where different team members have different qualities and properties, i.e. BA equipment, um, aero ladder platforms, you know, rope rescue, whatever the you know the pump operators, all the different aspects, you know, water supplies and all that sort of stuff. So when we're looking at those tactics in terms of a game of chess with the pieces and the rules, you have this lovely thing in there around these five essential aspects. They fall around measures, optimization, context, dynamics, and control. All those five essential aspects. Why did you get interested in the work? I think my interest started already when I did my uh, senior officer's course back in, in 1990, where I started thinking about that there, there wasn't really, we didn't really have any, any theory about how, how fire, firefighting operations, rescue operations work. It's. I mean, you you can see these patterns, but it's more like a a skilled craftsman. Yes, it's almost like an art form, isn't it? It's very personal. Everyone has their own different approach to it a little bit, but there there should ultimately be some overarching rules or thought processes which we could all adopt. The fire service is, and in it it still is, uh, in a sense, this this master apprentice. You have this master. Uh, in the trade and you have these students the apprentices and the master tell the apprentices this is how you do the work depending on which master you have when the the apprentices have questions you get different answers Mm. and i i was thinking about well there has to be a a better way of sort of figuring out what what is the best way of of doing a, a a fire operation because ultimately in terms of instructing and or teaching it as well in your capacity if we refer to it simply as an art form, or sometimes I've heard it referred to as an instrument, like there's a bunch of instruments. So when a certain incident commander shows up, they will play those instruments in a different way and you'll have a different outcome. Now it'll all be music and all of it might be safe, but there shouldn't be. And we sort of echo back to this at the beginning of our conversation. When you look across the different tactics across the world to ultimately deal with many of the same problems or incidents, it's interesting to see the different songs that get played if that makes sense even when many of the hazards risks and associated challenges will probably i, be I quite see similar. on many occasions i use the chess board as hmm. a uh, to make comparisons and and see the similarities but you can also use an, an orchestra hmm. where you have this conductor which is the the officer and then you have these different parts in the orchestra you have uh the violence up front and you have the the horns in the back and you have whatever and then you you you, you play a uh, a song and the the conductor sort of sets the the scene a little bit and and makes the uh, what do you call that makes the song makes, uh, makes uh, the, the tempo yeah. the tempo it's, sorry yeah 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 and hmm. and he sort of he or she sort of points at the different sections in the orchestra, and you have this, this, the same thing in in, in an operation, hmm. in a fire rescue operation, where you have this officer sort of, you have these people grouped, you have the violins here, that's that's the uh, that's the pumper, and you have the the BA crew in the back, and you have this uh, elevated platform over here, and they sort of he points them where you want them to be, and you sort of try to use your resources the orchestra in, in mm. the best possible possible way to make a, a, a beautiful song out of it and you can make comparisons to to art as well uh, if, if if you can well let me put it this way um and, and i do apologize but i'm i'm not very interested in sports that's okay <laughs> <We're> not... <laughs> I, i'm not the, the regular fire service guy neither am i don't worry about it but when i when i look at a uh, when when they when, when there's soccer on on the television, they play football. I I know some of the rules, of course, but I can most of us can usually tell if if the game is played well or not. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if if you uh, are cheering for Sweden or for Germany or for Australia, or whatever. 
Mm. But you can always, if, if there's a sort of a flow in the game, mm. and it, when it looks beautiful, in a sense, beautiful in a sense, it yeah. usually works pretty good. And also there's so many factors. Like, I love that analogy where you could apply it. So to use that sporting analogy, and again, I will get this totally wrong because I'll get it, but like the formation of the squad, for example, they might do yeah. a 4-4-3 four, four, or four, I don't know how, even how many players are involved in it, to be honest with you. But they'll either have that formation and, and in certain hands, that might seem risky or against a certain opponent, that might seem risky. But it also depends on different factors. So when I echo that onto like an incident command analogy, it would be some people will have a high risks appetite and they will go straight in for what we might refer to as rapid deployment. And they will take things that they will put in place systems of work that may in ways appear slightly riskier but if you are a more assertive individual if you've got really strong command presence if your briefing is really detailed to the point and well understood you almost shrink the likelihood or you shrink the opportunity for risk because you have controlled all of those aspects but with somebody who perhaps doesn't have that level of assertiveness or doesn't have that command presence or you know doesn't doesn't just have i always think of it like a hug you want to get to an incident and give it a really big hug as quick as possible what i mean by that is yeah, yeah. if you can't get your fingers all the way around the, the other side of it then this incident is bigger than you and you need to begin sectorizing it or you need more yeah. eyes ears observations yeah. and different areas of yeah. that incident ground but most people through their presence through their assertiveness through their control of their team and their briefings they can give it a big hug very quickly um, but people that operate slightly differently. And this is probably something I'd love to ask you around bringing people in who haven't had that. I mean, you said there about, or, or earlier, sorry, about spending a year in the military. That will give you a great character calibration about how to speak to people, you know, how to, you know, how, how to, to work with to. other people. Yeah. And how to, how to delegate people, how to do yeah. those sorts of skill sets. But if you haven't had them, if you've spent all of your life in an academic background, when it comes to a noisy, incident ground in the middle of the night and you know there's a knuckle dragging firefighter like me who only responds to strong command then that could really infuriate them if you yeah. are not clear concise assertive and then the risk heightens because our level of shared situational awareness starts to fall quite dramatically yeah i mean i i use regularly i use these everyday situations when i try to explain and teach in command and control okay to my students and there's so many similarities from the orchestra and there's a i have it with with the dog next to me i'm a, i'm her handler mm -hmm. she she has to trust me and i have to trust her you have the same with with the crews in in yeah. on the she fire needs station. to know who's in charge as well exactly she's a pack the, animal the, we all are yes yes and um in, on the fight in the fire stations the, the my crews need to trust me yeah. And I need to trust them. So you have these similarities. Uh, that's that's going down the leadership st thing, but it's it's very strongly connected to uh, command and control mm. and to tactics as well, because that's sort of where you start. I mean, command and control is a sort of the the hard the hard thing, how you organize things. Yeah. Uh, leadership is about how you work with people, mm -hmm. and and tactics tactics is to me how you sort of what you need to do to get things. In yeah. the way you need it to be done yeah if you have a business or an academic mindset that aspect you speak of there around control and tactics and strategies people can get that bit but i've seen people struggle with that aspect of command and i know we don't don't necessarily want to venture down the leadership aspect because that's been done in many capacities and people yeah, speak yeah, very highly yeah. of that but that command aspect if people feel like that's not a natural lean for them that can be difficult, whereas they can have their tactics and their strategies boxed off in their mind, or they can have them down on a piece of paper, or they know how they want it to look. But if they can't couple that with effective command, delegation, you know, a command presence, once again, I'm like a broken record, but that's where it all falls down. Um, what yeah, are some of the challenges you find when you're working with students? Is there a particular aspect that they that they struggle with or that you feel sometimes requires you know more more consultation or more deliberation for them i think one one of the the big things uh i was about to say the, the problem it's not really a problem it's, it's more like a challenge okay uh, and that's in many cases because they they come from this academics uh academic world mm. and they sometimes they tend to think too much so they, they try to analyze things yeah to to the point where you sort of find 
this is the best solution. Mm -hmm. This is the way to do it. And I try to explain to them from day one, I mean, there's, there's, there's no such thing as the perfect operation. No. Well, you, you might find it afterwards. When you analyze it afterwards, you can probably find the operation. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's likely, but in theory... It's always it easier to connect the dots looking backwards, isn't it? And also in academia, yeah. you yeah. are often dealing with fixed static problems, whereas when you move into the real world of emergency response... These are dynamic, ever-changing scenarios. Yeah. And if you spend too yeah. much time in contemplation, yeah. then the, the the answer or solution you believe you've come to has changed because it took you five minutes to get there. Yeah. And now the situation is different. Another seven resources have arrived or the incident has progressed or debilitated yeah. Yeah. to a point yeah. where yeah. So, it now so, presents a different set of circumstances. Yeah, so one of my challenges is to to sort of make them to understand that you you need to come to a decision at some point usually fairly quick mm. it's not going to be the perfect decision or decisions because it's usually several but you have to start somewhere yeah and then you have to work from from that point and make that uh, decision or that uh, situation better as you as you go along because it's a dynamic event i always try cases. and say like um don't let good be the enemy of perfect and what i mean by no, that exactly. is sometimes they'll be looking for the perfect solution when actually Sounds like we're not trying to put people at risk, but good is probably as as good as it's going to get. Yeah, and then actually, make it as good soon as we all start moving now. towards good, it will become great. But don't go. No, this isn't perfect. I haven't got all my. You're never going to get all them ducks in a row. It's like herding cats at an incident, yeah. isn't it? It's a, yeah. it's terrible. <laughs> it's yeah. just, and, and you, you know, can't you're do that. To create structuring out of chaos. Yeah, but I also coming back to tactics, tactics again. I try to make them to understand that this. It's if they. If when they realize that the the and, and pretty much any operation is very similar to a, a game of chess, where you have your pieces and you sort of move them around, I think it's easier for them to understand that okay, I have these these uh, and uh, sorry, I I can't really understand uh, recall what the pieces are called in English, but you have these different Fine. pieces and you try to move them around, and you have these uh, rules for every piece on the chessboard and you yeah. can just move them in certain ways and it's it's pretty much the same thing with the resources you have on the fire ground i mean if you have a a, a group of firefighters uh, with breathing apparatus you can use them in a in a in in some specific way if you have another group without the breathing apparatus you can't use them in the same way Hmm. But you have to, you have still, you still have to play the game in a sense. You have yeah. to use them because that's what you have. Hmm. And you also need to keep that communication frequent and yeah. uh, and clear to have that shared situational awareness of risk. Because often, if you, I always say, if you stay in your head, you're dead. And what I mean by that is you can't just have the plan inside your head. No. It needs to be verbalized to everybody. Yes. Because yeah. I often say as well, a lot of the time, great incidents are. 70 percent if not 80 percent confidence and 30 40 percent like full control and competency around the incident and people may disagree and they're just numbers for an example and what i mean by that is even if your plan is it echoes back to what i've just said if your plan isn't perfect you still need to be very confident with it because if you've got the perfect plan but you, you're you're timid about it. it's a little bit like when you see somebody turn up to basic first aid if they get up there and they fumble around for a second and they they just they don't they don't seem to have control of the situation. They could be a have a doctorate in um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, but the people around them are looking at them like you're going to kill this person. Whereas if you turn up and all you've got is a first aid at work ticket, but you are confident, you're down there, you're doing the assessments, you're doing the primary survey, you start doing your compressions. People are put to ease. They're like this person's here to help. They have got control of this. They are going to fix the problem. You, you mentioned risks, and it's a that's a sort of a an interesting thing I was talking thinking about here that when you get when you get these calls, uh, these hazmat calls, mm -hmm. where you have a, a hazardous substance being released, most people would go like, "Whoa, I'm not going there." Yeah, uh, this is dangerous. But 
and then you start to actually, in many cases, you you actually analyze the situation and you figure out, okay, we need this protection, we need to do this, and we need to do that, and, and this order and everything. But when when there's a house fire, we don't think about that. No. We just go there <clears throat> and we just dive in. And I was thinking, so what what's the difference between a, a hazmat situation and a house fire? Let me just describe the scenario I have when you get to the, to the scene. We have you have this building. Inside that building, there's an object releasing toxic substances that's filling up the, the building, and it it's also hot, so yeah. you have heat. It's like, well, that sounds like a hazmat situation. Maybe we should slow down a little bit. Well, it's not. It's a house fire, but we just dive in. You have this black box. It's full of smoke. And it's burning somewhere in that building. You don't know where it is. You don't know what's burning. You don't know if there is any other people inside. You don't know anything. Just know it's a building and it's full of smoke. And it's hot smoke. But we just dive into it. Yeah. But if you have this building that is filled with a, a toxic substance, you have this release of whatever chemicals inside. Hmm. We don't go there. We stay on the outside and then we analyze the situation and we figure out what protection do we need. And then we start to work our way out into the building and figure out what's going on. But when we get the fire calls, we don't do a similar, uh, we don't no. analyze the situation in a similar way. Is get, there an aspect yeah. there that risk has a strong association with frequency as well? Like if you're a builder and you work on a roof on a regular basis, your familiarity with that risk and tolerance and confidence with it as in being a height will become and it can become dangerously familiar to the point where you forget to clip on and fall off the roof but your competence in dealing with that situation is strongly associated with how frequently you interact with it and i wonder if we put hazmats on this pedestal because they are so infrequent and they're almost dealt with like their black magic do you know what i mean like yeah, there's but, some I mean, sort of if you let's say it's, it's like a general case you have this building again mm. all you know about the building is there is there is some kind of a chemical inside being released mm. well you have these hazmat suits and you still have the breathing apparatus put the suits on and go in and sit, check out what's going on what's the problem because once you go in there and you can actually read if you find the what do you call that you can find the, the UN number, with the you container, the, whatever the identification for it. Yeah. yeah, you can read on the sign what type of chemical it is, hmm. and then you can start work from there. If there is a, a house on fire and you go inside, you can't read anywhere. If it's a couch or a mattress or a television or it's a full room burning, there's no sign saying this. This is the stuff you have in this room, and mm -hmm. when it it burns, you get these toxic substances. Mm. But when you have a hazmat incident, you can read the sign telling you what kind of chemical it is, and then you can start to work on that. Yeah, which I suppose in ways should dramatically reduce your level of fear because once you've got the identification of what it is, there's a you know, there's a set. It's not it's not a problem and, anymore. It's not a problem because you just no. load it up on the system and it will tell you what firefighting media to use, what the control yeah. measures are. Yeah, and ultimately, like you which said means, about sticking on the suits, you've got a limited number of resources you can use anyway. So until you yep. actually go and find out what it is, it's not really going to change your strategy for dealing with it. You still need to go and find out. Which means that house fires are actually more dangerous than hazmat incidents. Yeah. But we don't look at it that way. We look at it the other way. And also, we, they know, we know they're more dangerous because of the inherent risks, but also the data tells us they're more dangerous because the amount of firefighters that die at hazmat incidents, and I'm going to pull figures out of my ass here, but it is certainly dramatically less then history would reflect number of firefighters die at yeah. house fires. I wonder why that is. We need to have a hazmat expert on at some point um, just I, to I try and it's... help dispel. We have a great one in the UK. The gentleman's name, uh, we call him Professor Green. I can't remember what his, what his real name is, but he's a fascinating guy and he dispels so many rumors and myths and yeah. fears around even things like the big scary stuff like um, radiation. Yeah. He's like, well, okay, what if you what if you ate it? Okay, what about if you come near it? You know, so when you're outside, you give an example like when you're outside and you're getting burnt by the sun, 
because you didn't put any sun. When you go inside, you're not still covered in sun and you're going to infect somebody with your sun. So it's like, and the way he breaks down alpha, gamma and, and all the different radiation. Yeah, yeah. And, all that. and I think, oh yeah, but we do just have this like inherent fear or mythology about how to deal with these things. He, he, he says it far better than me. I'm sure I've ruined that, but. I think it has a very strong historic thing about it. I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's called the fire service for mm. a reason firefighters go to fires they put fires out we have fire trucks and fire stations and whatever stuff we have fire hoses it, it's sort of in, in almost in the dna mm. we go to fires and we put fires out so we don't really think about that it might be very dangerous yeah it's sort of a almost like a not almost it's, it's an it's an expectation you're a firefighter there's a house on the fire why don't you go there and yeah like, no we can't because it's dangerous yeah, whereas when we think of hazmats, we have connotations or it brings memories back of or Chernobyl or a horrible disease or yeah. a substance that, you know, causes an infection amongst all of civilization. And yeah, very often that's not the case. I go, I worked at a station not too long ago where we had regional resources um, involved with detection, identification and monitoring and specific hazardous materials units and 99 times out of 100 the substances we would go to, it was like, oh, it's just baking powder or it's nothing or it's, you know, and they were so resource heavy with stand and watch of 20 yeah. plus firefighters whilst two people waddle over, come back, test it and go, it's absolutely nothing. And and yeah, very, very resource heavy. And everyone else tends to get there as well, the police and the paramedics and everybody. And it's very expensive. And yeah, we just kind of build it up around this fear aspect, don't we? I sometimes get that question. It's like, why don't you work toward mid hazmat incidents? And I'm like, no, it's too easy. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it is not much, more uh, interesting. Yeah, you're just talking right. about we talk about source, pathway, and receptor, and that's yeah. about it. And then we talk about cordons, yeah. and that's it. It's like yeah. stand back, wait for, wait to test it. When it tells you what to do, yeah. do the thing. There's less. Uh, unless it's got into a pathway or it's a gas that's spreading in a certain direction, even then there's very limited options. Whereas the tactics and, and multitude of different dynamics that that you go into with firefighting operations is is much much more meat on the bone there, isn't there? Yeah, fires are more challenging. Mm. It's it's dynamic in a very different sense. Can I ask you about strategies and tactics and how yeah. you see them as as being different if you do at all? There's a difference, but. It's also the same thing. The difference comes in time, pretty much. Okay. To put it simple, so uh, if you talk about strategy, it's uh, as as they usually say in the military, tactics is about winning the, uh, the the fight. Strategy is about winning the battle. Oh, sorry, the other way. Uh, winning tactics the war. is about win the battle, and strategy is about winning the war. Yeah. So it's it's the same thing. So you can actually talk about. The, you, you can use the same they're interchangeable the game, the, the game of chess extent. when talking about strategy as well the, the thing is that in when it comes to tactics each piece on the chess board is pretty much the, an individual firefighter or a a group of firefighters yeah but when you talk about strategy it's it's a it's a larger group or it might be a fire station or a city perhaps I remember, I forget what book it was I read it in, but um, I think of strategy and tactics like a highway. Like there'll be five lanes on the highway and each individual lane is like a tactic. Yeah. But the overall highway, the strategy yeah. is moving in the same direction. Now you can yeah. change lanes. Some of them are faster. Some of them are slower. Some of them might wind off into this village and then rejoin the highway. And others, But ultimately they're all heading north. Yeah, exactly. But people can get really caught up in that and they get bogged, they, they, they major in minor things and they can get married to one tactic at the detriment of like an incident analogy would be, you know, we're going offensive and we're doing internal this, but I'm like, what's the overarching goal of the incident? You're trying to bring it to a safe conclusion and limit the damage to the community and or environment. So you need to not get married to certain tactics and remember what the overarching strategy is, I suppose. Tactics is as part of a strategy. Hmm. You you can sort of disconnect them. They yeah. are connected all the way. I wanted to ask you if I could about the different. Well, I mean, you you actually founded. I only learned this from Shan recently because we spoke about the International Fire Instructors Workshop. You founded that, didn't you? Uh, I did. 
that's grown into quite a colossal beast over its lifetime. Talk to me about how that got started. What was the motivation for it? When did you put it together and, and sort of what it's become today? Well, that that also comes back to my trip to New Zealand uh, many, many years ago, 2007. And that was in, I went to New Zealand, I think it was like in mid-August, September or something. Two weeks later, I came back home and two weeks later, I was invited to a, a conference in Atlanta, which was uh, this uh, International Association of Fire Chiefs conference. Mm-hmm. And as a small part of that, uh, Institution of Fire Engineers had a, a, a sort of a conference within the conference. And I was asked to come there and talk about how we worked with uh, safety to firefighters. And I, no, sorry, it was the other way around. Exactly. I was, I went to Atlanta first. Oh, that was the fun part as well. I went to Atlanta <laughs> first and then I came back home for two weeks and then I went to New Zealand. That's the way it is. But in Atlanta, I, before going there, I, I asked the organizers about my presentation. I had asked how, how frank do you want me to be? And he said, we want you to be dead frank. Wow. So I was. How was that received? <laughs> uh, I would call that interesting. Uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, I, I had the presentation when I, when I started my presentation, that I had like thirty people or something in the room, and afterwards I, I found out that the rumors went around the floor at the conference. So when I ended my conf- my my presentation, I had like. 80, 100 people in the room. Whoa. That and and the, there, was, there was one guy who was a, a, a journalist in the room who wrote for this uh, newsletter, e-letter. Um, I can't recall the name of it right now, but I have it all somewhere. And so the week after, they sent out this e-newsletter to like 50,000 US firefighters uh, stating that these Swedish fire officers are saying that uh, American firefighters are stupid. Oh, and just for the record, I didn't say that. <laughs> what I did say was that something like, and, and I have that, I still have that manuscript somewhere. I said that sending someone into a certain death is a stupid thing to do. Mm. And hopefully most of us can agree on that. Of course. All, actually. Well, they have very different tactics, don't they? We're getting back yeah. to our previous yeah. conversation. Yeah. And some people For- do see that. Ta- and if they don't understand the different complexities around construction and, and other aspects, yeah. I'm not getting yeah. into it, but like, the, it can appear incredibly dangerous what they do sometimes. And we can't understand yeah. the logic behind it. Yeah. So the fun part is that when I when I came to New, to New Zealand, they all knew about that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of funny. Uh, so that was a part of it, including meeting Shan Rafael and realizing that we, we, like I said earlier, that we, we all firefighters and we do the same stuff everywhere, all over the world, although we do it slightly different, different perhaps, but still. Did that response not discourage you at all from continuing your work or continuing your passion no. of sharing the, because some people, and I have this with the podcast, you know, some people have written incredible reports they've done incredible research but they fear the repercussions of sharing it or speaking about it passionately because oh. you know i mean just chemically we are group animals like i've said before we don't want to lose face or be pushed away from the society or brotherhood familyhood whatever we're trying to belong to so you, you didn't feel no. you didn't feel discouraged from that environment no no well for a minute perhaps but I guess it's 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 it encouraged me to continue to sort of push things forward. And I, at, when I came back from New Zealand, I realized that, I mean, there's so many great people out there all over the world, uh, so that we we need to sort of to put them together somehow and 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 speak together internationally, just sort of share thoughts and share ideas, seek and share to understand. Knowledge. Yeah. Yes. And share the knowledge everywhere. Mm. So I, I I asked my employer back then, can, can I can I invite a bunch of people to our training academy and just sort of for a week 
we, we pay for the their uh, for living there and eating there and we have these workshops and discuss things and we do some training scenarios and whatever stuff for a couple of days I was like yeah sure go ahead that's a big uh, ask though you, you you're saying that like it was a small thing if i asked that of my service can we invite people from different continents or countries to come and share their they'd be like no well i don't know what they'd say because i haven't asked but you should try i will try well you know one of the things i'd like to do is um have you heard of the fleur lombard bursary or whatever it's called basically it's um there was a firefighter i spoke with a while ago who utilized this fleur lombard was a firefighter that died uh, the first female firefighter that died in wartime history in the uk okay, yeah. and um to try and stop things like that happening in the future they put together this bursary whereby you could access funding to go and travel to other countries and bring back learnings so very yeah. similar sort of concept and many yeah. organizations do very similar things but it's still a big ask and ultimately i mean ultimately you got the green light for it you must yeah. have been in a well-respected position to be asking questions like that that's not a cheap thing to ask no i haven't thought about it that way <laughs> well i mean you, well, shy, we, shy kids don't get sweets so you asked we, the question and they said yes we we had more money at the agency back then it's it's it would be much harder these days yes uh, but still manageable so i i had this bunch of people coming over it's like ed hart and Paul Grimwood, John McDonough, Shan Raphael, uh, and I do, I do, I do apologize. I can't re remember all the names. That's okay. Uh, yeah. At this, point. we've got them on the list. They're all on my hit list. Yeah. So have on the podcast name. Peter, Peter McBride people. from Canada, and a, and a bunch of great people, and and we just, I just gathered them in a room for a couple of days. So we had the the morning sessions we had in this in this room, and we just started talking. And the afternoon, we went out to our training grounds and just made some training scenarios and burnt stuff. What was the and... fundamental things? That, what was the like discussion areas or thing? When you sent these invites out, what was the pitch? What were you intending to discuss? Because ultimately, just, now just to, just to share knowledge. Okay, around a specific topic, around fire behavior, no. around command, or around what in particular? Fire, firefighting. Okay, all kinds of aspects. So it was like an an open. It wasn't just a piece of empty piece of paper. Yeah. Let's start from here. Okay. And that was sort of interesting as well because when we just people came over and on 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 the on Sunday night we we gathered at as at, at the colleague's house and it's like they all started talking. Yeah. As if they have known each other for like thousand years. <laughs> Again, we we do the same shit stuff all over the place. Yeah, yeah. We just talk different languages, and we have different color on our helmets, and we have different, slightly different technology, but still, in, 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 on many occasions, we have the, exactly the same technology. Were there any big things that really surprised you or really piqued your curiosity when a certain individual perhaps proposed a, a, a thought process or an approach where you went, Really? And that sort of head talk moment where you're like, tell me more about that. Was there anything that really surprised you in that first interaction or first workshop? I I was surprised how easy it was. Really? I was very nervous. <laughs> really? <laughs> Why? I mean, it, it, could, it could have been a, uh, uh, a flop, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we could have been sitting there for a week just saying nothing, talking about nothing. Uh, getting mad at each other, starting throwing things and whatever. Mm. But on um, just the first couple of minutes, I think we all realized we are all friends here. And it was a very open, th there were no taboos whatsoever. Really? We questioned everything. E Do you think, everything is it still like that now? Because you have to be like an eternal student to keep that curiosity. And when I spoke to Shan, like he's 61, 62 now, and he still seems like that playful child with that eternal curiosity. But some people, I, d I don't know if that's as prevalent now. I don't know if it's as common for people to have that open-mindedness. Maybe I'm being a bit pessimistic here. How, how have you found, has it changed at all over the years with the IFIW? No. Okay. Not in that group. <laughs> Not really. I think Maybe that the, the negative the, pessimists just don't tend I to go to those that, sorts of things. I think that the, the people who come to those occasions, those workshops, they those are people who are 
looking for like-minded yeah people that are willing to share their knowledge and are willing to sort of talk about anything mm. related to the fire service what i might be slightly uh, uh, concerned is that it it's well, at least for for this country, it's it's very hard, or maybe I haven't looked hard enough, to find people um, with that um, level of passion. The, yeah, exactly. The spark. I know it sounds hard sort of, and harsh to say sort of, that because there are a lot start, of passionate people, but yes, yeah, yes, there are. Yes, it's hard to find them. But yeah, it's. I can't really see. I I know a few guys, but in this country, but. I think there's been a generational shift in that level of confidence as well in people's ability to speak confidently about the things that they're passionate about. And I wonder if the younger generation, I don't know if technology's played a role in that, how much we are willing to Maybe. lean into or engage with these sorts of public demonstrations of our own knowledge and passion. I think some people, and we tend not to have them on the podcast because they just don't attract that sort of audience, but it does seem like, it's less cool to be so passionate about the job sometimes now. <clears throat> I think I so very early in my career, I sort of uh, ruled out being well, looking for the career in sort of the, the traditional way. Okay. I mean, the, the tradi traditional way in the fire service is that you sort of start as, as the fireman, you work way up and then you become the fire chief at some point. I was like fairly early that I'm not interested in, in having that kind of career. Mm. I'm not interested in, in being the big boss. I'm interested in looking at knowledge and trying to make things better. So I, I don't have any, well, I, I, I don't really, well, I do, but I was about to say, I don't really care what's happening to me personally, in a sense, mm. from a career point of view. I'm interested in finding the knowledge and sharing that knowledge with other people. You which is speak a, a, into a, the choir with that sort of thing honestly it's, I like I mean it's it's a it's a career it's a career in itself mm. but it also means that I don't really have to if 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 I step on someone's toes I don't really care mm. well I can apologize of course but if if someone is insulted for whatever reason I I can you probably explain why I insulted them and it wasn't on my intention but we, we still need to sort of open your mind, open our minds a little bit to sort of look outside hmm. and not being insulted just by being questioned. Yeah. You need, you need to question things and you need to question other people and ask questions like, why are you doing what you're doing? And you when need to I be open to that question as well. I exactly. Always say. When I ask those questions, a lot of people get pretty much insulted. But mm. there is it's not my intention. I ask the questions because I really want to know. Why do you do what you do? Mm. And it What's tests the, the validity of their belief as well in it, yeah. as well, doesn't it? Yeah. I always say have strong views weekly held. Because if you can't demonstrate like if I said to you, what data or what viewpoint would cause you to change your idea or your perspective? And if you if you can't demonstrate what would cause you to change your view on something then you don't actually have a logical view you have an, an like an ideological religious belief if no piece of information would discourage you from believing what you believe then you don't have a logical rational idea you have a whimsical belief that you, you, it's not founded on anything and you can't you can't articulate to me why and like you say that's what then tends to provoke that defensiveness in the questioning of it i, I mean if you have this this group of people discussing things and everyone goes like, oh, yes, that's great. That sounds good. That's a great idea. You need someone in that room going like, hang on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Is this really good? Is this true? Could we do it in, in another way? You need a red team. But every time I do that, mm. every time I do that, and I do that almost every day. There's always someone in that room who gets insulted. So what happened if we could get, put that aside? And when that person in the room says, hang on a minute, everyone would go like, well, we should think about this for two more minutes. Mm -hmm. 
before we make the decision mm. or before we go down that road. You always need to question things. How do you communicate that when you are teaching command and control? Because there's a place for conversation and deliberation and discussion, but that has to be calibrated when you enter into an incident ground. When you're on the fire ground, you need you still need to ask the questions, but uh, you sort of you need to sort out when do I ask those questions openly and when do I keep the questions in here mm -hmm. to myself for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. You you need that thought process all the time. Sort of when when you when you make a decision and you send the, the crews to do something. For obvious reasons, you you need to to make a decision and make uh, make things happen. At the same time, you need to keep that the question open. Sort of, is this the right thing to do right now? Should we do something else? So, th I mean, there there are questions you need to sort of speak out openly, but there are also questions you need to keep up here in your mm -hmm. mind for yourself. Yeah, but always ask the question. So I tried to sort of make the students understand that. Which is yeah. not very easy when you're like 24 years old. Yes. With no experience. <laughs> yeah, you can't be the child going, why? But why? But why? Yeah, it can't be an eternal democracy. No. Um, some of no. those questions live inside a debrief or a yes. learning conversation later on. We we spend a lot of we spend a lot of time if if we have a, a training scenario running for like let's say an hour, when we try to spend at least the same amount of time having a discussion afterwards. Mm. See, so if I have a training scenario one hour, then we have a discussion for one hour or an hour and a half or two hours. And then the next week I have a class, then we bring up the questions again. It takes a level of maturity though, doesn't it? That can be difficult, especially yeah. in an environment now where people have short attention spans or shorter than they used to be. Those conversations I personally have found can be quite difficult. I, I introduced a new rule in my class last week. It's like no computers in my class. And they're like, well, no, you need paper and pencil and you write it. Yeah, I couldn't do that because I tried to introduce that. And some people said they have certain learning styles that require them to use a laptop. But I find it disconnects you from the rest of the room, and it, I, I've not managed to get a solution to that yet. I, I get all kinds of, well, not yet, because they uh, that was their second day on the class, so they, they still think I'm sort of deciding, uh, I, I'm, I'm the boss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to change, trust me. Uh, so they still think that what I say is the law. Non-negotiable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I already noticed that they hooked up on that and they realized that this is pretty good. Mm. And I I tested that on my colleagues before I introduced the rule and they, they were like, well, what if they say, um, I don't have time to write everything you say. And I'm like, well, you're not supposed to write everything I'm saying. I'm saying you're supposed to listening mm -hmm. to what I'm saying. I, I can't write down everything you have on your PowerPoint. It's like, you're not supposed to write down everything I have on my PowerPoint because I'm going to give you my PowerPoint. I'm going to give you the notes afterwards. Yeah. So you make, you make notes, just a sentence and you, a word, whatever. And then you compare your notes with my PowerPoint. It's a learning opportunity to mm. compare that. And when you have a, a paper and a pencil, you can make drawings and you can uh, draw an arrow from that sentence to another sentence somewhere else on the paper. Yeah. You can't do that on computer. Well, you can, but it's like... so disruptive, isn't it? I find it takes people out of the room. And yes. also, like for me, yes. I have elements of ADHD and things like that. And if someone's tapping away on something in the room, I cannot, I can't engage. It just... Uh, it really it helped. I struggle with that when someone's doing that in the room. Well, I, I had that question as well for my colleagues. Well, what what if they have uh, what's that called in English? Dyslexia. 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 Yeah, they can't yeah. read it. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, well, then I send them to my to our librarian because she's got computers without any internet connection. 
So you actually can just write on the computer. The problem is that what I've seen over the years is that if they have the computers in the classroom, they start, when I get slightly boring, <laughs> it happens, trust me, they start to look on everything else yeah. on the internet. Or if Answering I, emails, doing whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Or if I have, uh, if I talk about risk management on the fire scene, they start to Google risk management on the fire scene. Yeah. And then I lose them for two minutes. And then we're disconnected from the classroom. Yes. And it takes them, even if they, if even if it takes them like 30 seconds to do that on the computer, it's going to be at least 30 seconds because before they are back in. It's longer the than that. With the People say like, exactly. oh, I yeah. can multitask. You can't. Yeah. We become no. more efficient at task switching. No. But no. I've, I've read the data to be and like. In the classroom. It takes you like three minutes to task switch effectively. So if I yeah. now picked up my phone whilst we're having this conversation and did something briefly, it would take my mind, apparently, three minutes to reorientate back yeah. to where we are in this conversation. People yeah. can't multitask. They think they can. They can't. No. no, no one can. No. No. I I want them to be present in, in the classroom. Yeah. To be active in the classroom, to share their thoughts with me and to their classmates and to have the discussion in the room because that's mm. the learning opportunity mm. google things they can do that at the night or the mm. weekends look at my powerpoint they can do that at night or the weekends be in the classroom to take me back for a second to the uh, fire instructors workshops this has been going now for how many years 2000 when did it start 2000 since 2008 2008 so how has it grown? Because it's got its own arms and legs now, and it's you know it operates every single year. Obviously, it had a, a flat patch during COVID. Everybody yeah, did, but yeah, like, yeah. what has it become now? Uh, it's running. It's in Spain this year, isn't it? It is Portugal. Sorry, yeah. Because I'm hopefully going to be attending and, and annoying you with a bunch more questions. Ah, ah but, great. <laughs> what What has it grown into now, and uh, what does it look like? What can people who have never been? I know we've spoken briefly around it now. Is it still themed around the same thought processes or is there things that, that people could find out about it? I think it's still, I we, we I, <laughs> I made some rules for it several years ago, just some basic rules. You, you need to have at, at least, I think it's like, like at least three countries present. You need at least one scientist in the room. We don't have any, any budget for anything. It's on a be there and sort of be interested and be active. It's okay. it's it's a it's a thought process. It's about sharing knowledge. That's mm -hmm. a basic thing about this. And and even if we have these organizations inviting us, they don't get any benefits in any way. It's it's on a sort of a and, and we make that very clear. We try to at least it works pretty good. So even if we have this this company uh, manufacturing turnout gears or whatever, they don't get any benefits. I mean, yeah. they they can probably sort of show off show their their their, their clothing, but that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't get in extra seats or whatever at the table. Okay. They are supposed to join the discussion at the same same basic rules as the rest of us. We are there for sharing knowledge. So you have to participate. You have to show up and engage yes. like a student yeah. with, with an yeah. opinion. It's not yeah. just a sit seminar style no. approach no. to life. How is it set out? Because it's run over a few days, isn't it? Well, it, on many occasions, we have, it, it's been like a sort of a two or three days workshop mm -hmm. with sort of active. And for economic reasons, there has been on many occasions like a two-day conference open for anyone. You have to pay the conference fee probably. Uh, mm -hmm. But apart from that, sort of, it seems to work out pretty good. <laughs> It's wonderful though, and we're going to put the um, link to it in the in the podcast notes so people can go and find out. I'd strongly encourage people yeah. to go, only from what I've heard about it, and it's what's incentivized me to hopefully attend this year and and, and become part of that discussion. And also, yeah. like like you were saying, just try and share some of that um, in a different way, in a different you know guise to to a wider set of people, because it's just, it astonishes me when I speak to some people in the UK Fire and Rescue Service about some of our guests, and they go. Oh, I'd never heard of that person before they were on. I'm like, you're joking. They've been writing books and articles for the last 20 years. But I think so many of us don't tend to engage with those materials in the same way anymore. That's why I think things like podcasting is important. I actually have one question left for you anyway. But um, 
before I pose that last question to you, it's just around the book. Is there anything that we haven't spoken about that you'd love me to ask you about or get in before we look to wrap it up? Well, I, I can mention one, maybe a, a, a sort of an obvious thing here is it's, uh, that it would be about fire ventilation. Absolutely. And that, that was actually part of my PhD work many years ago that I started looking into fire ventilation. And that was sort of, a again, from a tactical point of view. So I used fire ventilation experiments and theories to sort of look into tactics a little bit. So I, I wrote this book on fire ventilation that was released in uh, year 2000. It was also translated into English in, I think, it was a couple of years later. A couple of years ago, I, I was asked if I could do uh, a, a revision of that book. Revision of it, yeah. Because ventilation and just constructions and the way in which we use it and the different phases that we have in the UK, yeah. as an example, has changed tremendously. Also, the technology has developed. So I did that, and it turned out that the, the revised version actually became almost exactly twice as thick. <laughs> it was twice as many words in it, twice as many pages in it. It was like, well, that's great, because it means that we've learned something. Hmm. And I, I met so many people over, over those 20 years working with fire ventilation and talking to me about fire ventilation i I, i've talked a lot to chris garcia i've talked to um, a professor in in austin texas um, and i talked to a bunch of people steve kerber not at least yeah and uh, and many other people and it's like we've learned so much over those 20 years so that was sort of a when i realized that the 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 revised version was going to be twice as thick i was like well (laughs) that's great what are some of the biggest changes that you think you've seen across the way that it's used and the different tactics? I think, generally speaking, we have become much better in the fire service, generally speaking, to sort of... Uh, well, coming back to where I started talking about that master-apprentice mm. thing, we have become better at actually uh, looking at fire service stuff from a more analytical point of view. And there's a lot more people these days understanding that there is so much more in, in, in an operation, a fire operation, fire risk operation, than just listening to this master yeah. and doing what the masters did. And we do the same. I think people are starting to understand. And I think we've got to understand that for several years by now, too. We need to look into this more into detail. Mm-hmm. There's so many things in the fire service and putting fires out that we still don't understand. We do operation. It works pretty good. But I still think that there's a lot more to look into and learn to uh, and to be able to do operations much, much better. I think I'm not saying we do uh, badly, uh, but we, I still think we can do it much better. Absolutely. I think that learning process is better with incidents like road traffic collisions, because ultimately, if you don't find a solution at some point, then nothing's going to get any better. Whereas with a fire, eventually, they all go out anyway. You can do it, you can do most of it wrong. And still, it's uh, there's no there's no fire yeah. that ever started that's probably still burning now. Because no. ultimately, you could have got it wrong, and it still went out, yeah. which yeah. I suppose discourages that learning iteration a little bit because ultimately we eventually got there but yeah you have to be very curious to continue to lean into how can we do it better yeah and there's so many things around us in society that 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 is changing everything from constructions construction types Uh, we have high rises we have uh, buildings below ground yes and we have infrastructure, we have trains and cars and airplanes and ships and electrical cars and lithium batteries and whatever. And we are still trying to figure out how to work operations in those scenarios. Mm. We're always one step behind in a sense. I, I mean, think we're several batteries. steps behind of some like lithium batteries. We're having an expert on the podcast soon about that because we yeah. are so behind the curve yeah. on it's, adapting we, we're our always dynamics. Behind. Yeah, we're always behind. It's like we we have wooden buildings. It's uh, these days you're allowed to have high rises uh, in in wood construction in this country. Mm, yeah, and I'm like, well, <laughs> there's a reason why we did ban that for many years. 
<laughs> but suddenly we start to to uh, allow it again. But ultimately, but there's an argument there, there for are... when people say about Americans and their tactics. The reason we can get away with some of that with modern construction is because of the chemicals and how the materials are treated and the the fire suppression systems and tactical ventilation systems that they try and put in place in these and they don't always get it right but that's the key you just said it they don't mm. always get it right no so what happens when they don't get it right well the fire service comes around which means that whenever people have a problem which they haven't engineered away the fire service comes around to solve that problem which also means that the fire service we need to be on our toes all the time to figure out what is it that the engineers haven't engineered away. Yeah. Because then we have to engineer it into the fire service. Grenfell, in a way, without um, trying to put it in a box, is yeah. uh, an example of that. Because there were many suggestions and amendments that needed to be made to that building. But ultimately, we didn't have a perfect answer to how to deal with that no. and the structural... No adaptations and safety considerations had also not been put in place which left us in a very rock and a hard place kind of analogy so for people that are unfamiliar with the content stuff we obviously had that book some time ago and then you've done a reiteration but you're currently writing a book on firefighting tactics are you not yes i am wonderful when do you anticipate that being released and what could people expect from it uh, the answer in, in on both questions will be I have no idea. <laughs> well, I, I I'm in a discussion with with a uh, the publisher. Wow, so you're at that point Hope already. So you've done a lot of the work. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, this spring it's going to be in Swedish. Uh, I'm discussing with them to translate it into English as well. Um, mm. Hopefully, otherwise that's Google Translate <laughs> works pretty good <laughs> sometimes. It must be a colossal uh, piece of work to put these together. I mean, it's. Um, I I've, I've been working on that manuscript manuscript for like twenty five years. Bloody hell, man! Although it's been arresting place. for many years, so I I took it up again just a couple of years ago, and I I realized that I need to do something about this be before I retire. I still have like ten years before I retire, but ten years is a very short period of time. Blink in and you miss it. Yeah. <laughs> but and uh, what? What can people expect from it? I think that in on many occasions, when when someone writes a, a book on tactics, uh, and, and I do apologize again, but I think that the expectations and the author usually writes those books in the sense that this this is this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. This is how you should do it. What I'm writing is more like this is how you can think. Yes, these are the things you maybe you should think about these things and maybe you should think about it in this way instead mm. i'm i'm writing about the the chess game yeah make uh, comparisons with i haven't used the orchestra yet but since you're giving me that idea i might do that as well <laughs> fold it in there somewhere um, the, the, the sports thing i'm looking into the military side mm. of it i mean they're talking about tactics as well and it's and it's fairly similar um, so it's it's a I would say it's a fairly different approach than what we're used to when yeah. we're talking about tactics. It's not prescriptive. I mean, I mean, in the UK, no. we've moved no. in the last few years to a framework of national operational guidance, which is much yeah. less prescriptive. It's more of a, as you articulate it, that it's a thought process. Yeah, have these considerations and have these have the awareness of these chess pieces of what things you could put in place. Yeah. Yeah. and how that would contribute to your overall plan. But this yeah. is just guidance. Do you know what I mean? If you get too prescriptive on things, people push themselves into boxes that very much yeah. limit their ability to lead an incident uh, most effectively. What I'm hoping is that if someone re reads the, that book, is that they, they start to think differently. Not necessarily act differently, but just sort of starting a thought process a little bit. That's the best way and of doing it. Looking at fire operations differently. Yeah. Hmm. Without telling how you should do things. Well, that'll ultimately make it eternal content as well. That will that would hopefully allow it to be something that people could reflect on in 15, 20 Maybe. years and still be applicable. Maybe. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Our, you know, we've gone in so many lovely different directions there. I am going to put in the notes for this around. So there'll be a link to the IFIW and I will dig out a link to um well, we'll put in the link 
for the document that we've been referring to as well, and also to your previous book around ventilation. Where's the best sure. place to send people? Is it the be- is the IFIW the best place to send them to find out a little bit more about yourself? Well, yes, or they could just send an email. Are you happy for your email address to be available publicly? Think about they that. Can, Tell me they later. Can, <laughs> yeah, they can probably find it anyhow. But okay. just just a precaution. Busy days, I might not answer anything very fast. But hey, usually I'm just I try to answer any any email I get. Sometimes it'll be weeks and weeks before I get back to replying to people. It's yeah. not out of disrespect yeah. or anything like that. No. It's just life is so goddamn busy, and the inbox yeah. fills up very quickly. Yeah. But um, thank you so much for your time, boss. Thank you very much for having me. We'll wrap it up there, but I will hopefully see you in Spain and Portugal later on in the year. But uh, I'll know that being too much long before then, and we can uh, maybe do this again sometime. Sounds great. Thank you, Stefan. Really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Take care, my friend. You too. Firefighters Podcast is put together to develop, inspire, and hopefully even motivate those individuals who have chosen to serve our communities and be part of the first responder family. It's brought to you by myself, Operational Firefighter Pete Wakefield. If you have enjoyed today's episode and you want to see the podcast continue, please head over to our Patreon page where you can support the ongoing efforts of the podcast. Please hit that follow, subscribe, or rate button on whatever platform you're listening to. Please support your emergency services responders, and thank you for listening.